As you see, the topic of my sermon tonight is um, what kind of slave was Philemon? Now, I'm going to assume that most people here know the story of Philemon. As you know, Paul wrote the letter to Philemon, a uh, short, very short letter to an individual, and we're told that Philemon um, was a slave owner. And we know that in that letter, Paul is telling Philemon that he would like for him to take Onesimus back uh, as a brother in Christ because apparently from that letter we gather that Onesimus had ran away from Philemon. But while he had run away from, from Philemon, he was uh, apparently converted by Paul and had become someone that was useful to Paul. And so we, we have the letter of Philemon. It's urging Philemon to release Onesimus, not necessarily uh, you know, commanding him to, but Paul is urging him to do them, uh, give, ha, telling him to do it on his free, uh, on, from his free will so that he would re release Onesimus to go back to Paul and help work with him. So what kind of slave owner then was Philemon? Now, when I read Philemon and when I have been taught in, in class since I started going to church, we're told that Philemon, of course, was a slave owner. And sometimes that is used to justify uh, the, the, the institution of slavery because after all, if, if God would have wanted slavery stopped, he would have told Philemon to, he would have commanded Philemon to release Onesimus. But he didn't command him to, he asked him to. So I'm thinking, when I think of slavery, probably like you do, I think of slavery that occurred in the United States during the 17th, 18th centuries, part of the 16th century, uh, excuse me, 17th century, um, where we had people that were brought from Africa and put on uh, plantations here and worked against their will. And we think of that concept of slavery, and I don't know about you, but that, that concept just seems absolutely wrong to me. How could anything like that be right? How can anything like that be condoned by God? Now I know we heard a lesson from this pulpit two, not too many months ago from Jerry about this very subject, and I'm not here to uh, uh, indict his sermon, but I do think there were some things maybe left on the table that I'd like to add to that sermon. So this is, a, I, I consider this a complimentary uh, sermon to what he taught, because I think there are some things that we need to think about when we look at the idea of slavery. Unless you think slavery is gone, it hasn't, and I'll bring that out at the end of our lesson. There are still slaves in the world today, and there's, there's uh, millions of them. So how would we define slave, a slave? Now this definition of slavery comes from the United States government, actually. You can go to Webster's and you can go to uh, other dictionaries and look at the, the, the definition of slave. It will be similar to this, but this comes straight from our U.S. government. A slave is a person who is recruited, transported, or compelled to work by force, fraud, or coercion, and victims cannot leave on their own will. So one of the concepts of, of slavery that we need to understand is that slavery as we define it in modern day terms, and slavery as it was defined several centuries ago, involves recruiting and transporting people that are compelled to work. They're not doing this on their own free will. They're coming here because somebody has com compelled them, forced them through fraud, through coercion, through kidnapping, through whatever means they can, and that these victims, once they are slaves, are not allowed to leave on their own free will. That's what I think of when I think of the word slave. So when you read in your Bible the word slave, that's what I would first come to my mind. The thing about this is, that may or may not be true. But let's look at, let's look at some things first. The Bible does seem to allow it. First of all, we see no objection in the Old Testament. Old Testament deals a lot with slavery, and it's my, we'll, we will look at a few verses tonight that deal with the Old Testament, but it's not my intent to look at all those verses. We wouldn't have nearly enough time to do it. But the Bible certainly does deal with slavery and servitude, if you will, in the Old Testament. It deals a lot with it, but we don't see anything in the Old Testament that just outright objects to it, not that I could find. And secondly, as I've already alluded to, there doesn't seem to be a command in the New Testament to release slaves or servants once again. So it would seem as if the Bible does allow it. So question is, does the Bible approve something that seems so obviously wrong? 
Does it really approve something that seems so obviously wrong? A few points I want to make before we delve into that. When we look at the word slave in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word is evit or evit, and it occurs some 46 times in the Old Testament. In your King James Version, that word is always interpreted servant, except in one spot, and that's in Jeremiah 2.14. I won't turn to that, but if you look at the word slave in your American Standard Version or New American Standard Version, as opposed to your King James Version, you'll see that it's interpreted servant in the King James. If you look at it in the New Testament, the Greek version, the Greek word is dolos, and it again is always interpreted servant in the King James. Well, when did that change? It changed with the American Standard Version. That's when it changed. So when you see the American Standard Version coming out uh, the early 1900s, as I recall, then that word that is, that is interpreted servant over and over and over again in the King James Version is now usually interpreted slave. And so we think of the word slave primarily, I believe, because of the, the latter translations. But the word itself does not necessarily imply that someone is working against their will. There were voluntary servants in the Old Testament. There were voluntary servants in the New Testament. Now, it could involve someone who might be working against their will, but it doesn't mean it every time. And so when we look at that word, we need to look at, at the context in which it is in and not just assume that when, when we read the word servant or read the word slave in our American standard, our new American standard, that that is always talking about someone that has been entrapped, who has been kidnapped, who is now working against their will because it doesn't necessarily mean that. We have to look at the context. So why does the New Testament seem to approve it? I'm going to kind of keep most of my thoughts tonight to the New Testament because we don't have time again to look at all the Old Testament passages. We will look at a few. But why does the New Testament seem to approve it? Well, first of all, it doesn't. It doesn't approve the type of slavery that you and I think of when we think of slavery. It just does not. And we'll see compelling reasons why it would not uh, approve of something like that. Certainly it does not. My question is, since God didn't seem to say anything in the New Testament to release those slaves and, seem, and seemed to allow slaves, once again could be servitude, not necessarily slaves, can God allow something to occur without approving it? Has he ever done that? Has he ever allowed something to occur without necessarily approving it? And I think you know the answer to that. Of course he has. If you have your Bibles handy, look at Mark chapter 10. Beginning in verse 5. But Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And for this cause, he man, he, and for this cause a man shall leave his father and mother, and the two shall become one flesh. Consequently, they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. It's my belief that God intended one man and one woman. And I think this verse and other verses that we'll point to in a minute uh, uh, show that. But yet we know that in the Old Testament, polygamy was allowed. But I don't believe it was God's original intent. If you look at Ephesians chapter 5, that, that chapter, in the latter part of that chapter, we will not turn to read that. But if you look at that, you'll see that Paul is talking about the, the relationship between the husband and the wife. Not necessarily multiple wives, but that close relationship that a husband has with his wives. And furthermore, we know that the qualifications of elders was the husband of one wife. So we don't practice polygamy in our society anymore. And I do not believe polygamy is proved by the New Testament. And yet at one time, it was allowed. What else did God allow at one time? How about divorce? Divorce was, was allowed, and I would just refer you back to the same verse we just looked at, looked at in verse 2. And some Pharisees came up to him, testing him, and began to question him whether it was lawful for a man to divorce his wife. And he answered and said to them, What did Moses command? And they said, Moses, 
Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. But we have just read where that was not God's original intent. And you can go to Matthew 19 and see where that practice is also condemned, the divorcing of, of the spouse except for one specific reason. So God allowed divorce to occur at one time. It was not his intent. In fact, if you look at Malachi chapter 2, verses 16, what does that say? It says God hates divorce. So here's something that God actually hated, but yet he allowed to occur because of the hardness of their heart. So sometimes God can allow something. Again, I allude to Matthew 19, verses 8 and 9, that was allowed, but does not, did not, uh, was not something that God actually approved of. So I want to look at slavery during the Roman times, and to look at slavery then as it was practiced at the turn of the century, not the turn of the century, but 18th and 19th centuries in, in America, and, and the Americas as a whole. Because I think if we look at that, we might see a little bit of a difference that may help explain what I would call a little bit of a quandary as to how could it appear that the Bible allows something to occur that seems so heinous to us. So I just want to look real briefly then at slavery as it occurred during the Roman times. And Jerry pointed out some of this in his sermon. During the Roman times, uh, slavery depends on who you want to read. Uh, historians don't agree with it uh, 100%, but it could have made up as much as 50% of the working force of the Roman Empire, but at least probably 20%. So you would understand that that would be millions of people. And if, if, it, if the number of 50% is correct, then every other working person in the Roman Empire was a slave or a servant of some sort. So it was very much a part of the culture of, of the Roman Empire, that is for sure. Much different than it was here and certainly different than it is now. We also know that basically there was two major ways, a, a few others, but I'm just gonna include these two as the, as the major ways in which slavery occurred in the, in the Roman day. One could be by conquest, and that was probably two thirds of the slaves. So two out of three slaves were, uh, were captured during a Roman conquest and they became slaves. Well, I would ask you, what was their alternative? Well, their alternative was they could, have been, they could have been slain. They could have been killed. So if I was captured by the Romans, I probably would have volunteered to be a slave at that point, although they didn't do it voluntarily. I'm not, I'm not seeming to apply that. But if I had the choice of death or become a slave, which one am I gonna take? I'm gonna become a slave. And that was two-thirds of the slaves that, that we read about during the Roman times. Another one-third, and this is very important, one-third of them were bond servants. And the Bible in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament uses the word bond servant. It's interesting that in the American, American Standard Version, the bond servant will be used when it seems appropriate, and then the word slave will be used when whoever's interpreting that word wants it to mean that. But there was the concept of bond servant. What is a bond servant? A bond servant is someone who voluntarily goes into servitude for whatever reason. Maybe they owed a lot of debt, and the only way they could get out of debt was selling themselves to work for an individual as a slave. It wasn't always permanent. Sometimes it was, but sometimes it was not permanent. After they were out of debt, they were no more longer considered a bond servant. But that word bond servant can be interpreted slave in our New Testament. So that's very important. They, these people were volunteering their services, not because they necessarily wanted to, usually because they had to. They were, they, had, they were in debt and they had to do it. Sometimes they would actually sell their children. We read about that in the Old Testament too, but in, in the New Testament days, during the Roman days, they would sometimes sell their children. Now usually when they sold a child into servitude, that was not a permanent arrangement, but it was still the concept of bond servant. These kids didn't do that voluntarily, I'm sure but they were sold into uh, servitude as a result. And so if you look at slavery, I delved into this uh, as a, for the purpose of this lesson, to look at what kind of work did the slaves do during the Roman times, or the servants do during the, during the Roman's time, and it was a whole lot of different things. They weren't necessarily just hard labor working in the fields and all that. In fact, there were some white collar slaves, and there was no way to, to necessarily tell when you were working in, a, in, in, in Rome, where you could be working side by side with a slave and not necessarily even know it. There was no way to quote unquote mark them. It wasn't a racial thing at all. And so you would see them in the mining field, but you would see them in domestic work. You would see them in trades, uh, tradesmen, white collar work. Now sometimes the gladiators were slaves. They had prostitutes that were slaves like we have today. That, that was part of slavery during that time. 
Uh, but there was various things that they did, and it wasn't all regulated to just real hard domestic, uh, domestic work or, or labor type work. And here's the other thing, during the Romans time, uh, it was very regulated. There, you couldn't just do anything you wanted to do with your slave, it was very regulated. And you could free your slave if you wanted to. But it was regulated so that you couldn't just free all your slaves at one time for probably a very good reason, which we'll look at in just a minute. So that's slavery in the Roman times. So why is it again, why is it that the Old Testament and the New Testament, especially the New Testament, since that, that's what we're looking at, doesn't, doesn't compel the slave owners to release their slaves? Well, first of all, even if we read about the slaves in the New Testament and they are slaves, which I don't think they're slaves in the way that we think they're slaves, but even if they were, the purpose of the gospel wasn't to change that societal uh, practice that was going in at that time. And again, Jerry in his sermon pointed that out very, very nicely. That was not the purpose of the gospel. Gospel is to save souls, not necessarily change a slave into a free man. Here's the other thing, though. During the Roman times, it may not benefit the slave to have been released. I mean, they were, these, these people were working. It was their job. And if they were released from their job, they wouldn't have a job anymore. And in some cases, you had very old people. If they were suddenly released from their servitude, where would they go? Where would they stay? They didn't own anything. So how would they get released? Uh, how, what would they do when they got released? It might not have been real beneficial for them to be released all of a sudden. The second thing would be, if you had 50%, as much as possibly 50% of the workforce as slaves, and you suddenly release those into the workforce, and now they're free, quote unquote, it would have been catastrophic. There's no telling what would have happened during that society at that time had that not occurred. Now, I don't know if that's the reason that the gospel doesn't talk about releasing the slaves specifically, but it certainly makes sense that it probably would not have been a good thing to do at that particular time with those types of servants that they had. So that's slavery in, in the Roman times. Well, let's look at slavery in America. You don't want to pick on America because it was all the Americans. It was South America, it was the Caribbean, it was the United States, the slavery that occurred all over the Americas, as it were, quite a bit different. The slaves, in, the slaves in America were kidnapped. In fact, during that 250 year period or so that slavery was taking place, there was estimated 11 million slaves that were kidnapped, imprisoned, and transported by ship. That's how they got here. You understand that a slave in the United States, especially early on, didn't come because they volunteered to come to America to start a new life. They were not immigrants. They were not people from Scotland and Ireland and other places that were coming to our country to be immigrants. They were forced to do it. They were kidnapped. They were imprisoned. They were transported by ship. What drove slavery during the 17 and 1800s? What were the major driving forces? Well, originally it was sugar. If, if you read or, or study about Alexander Hamilton, who was uh, one of the founding fathers of the United States, <coughs> the first, I guess, Secretary of Treasury, if you will, brilliant man, uh, Alexander Hamilton was not a Native American. He was born in the Caribbean, in a little uh, island called Nevis, which is part of St. Kitts Island. And he came as a young man to the United States, but when he was in uh, Nevis, in the Caribbean, he saw slavery up front and, and close and personal, and he be became, uh, began to abhor it because of the way the slaves were treated on these sugar, plant, uh, sugar cane plantations. They were brutally treated, uh, usually worked for hours on end in, in the hot sugarcane fields, and then that sugarcane had to be processed to get sugar from it. And many times these slaves would die while they were working. It didn't, they were relatively cheap and they could get more slaves if they died. They were treated brutally and horribly. And so Alexander Hamilton, when he came to the United States, was, was, was not someone who advocated slavery. And it was sugar that did this. It was sugar that was used here, but primarily used over in Europe, where sugar was going to from these plantations. And that's what drove slavery. It was greed. That's what it was. And our taste for sugar. I like sugar. Everybody likes sugar. And they did back then, too. And so when the abolitionist movement began, one of the things these people would do is they wouldn't eat sugar because of that. But then came along cotton. And cotton became a big industry, of course, in the Deep South. And how do you harvest cotton? They didn't have the machinery we have now, obviously. They needed manpower. And how were they to get that manpower? <coughs> Through slavery. 
through forcing people to uh, come against their will and be treated uh, harshly against their will to work in the cotton fields. Those were the two main, main drivers. It was greed, it was our, our desire for our sugar and our desire for cotton. It's been called a barbarity that is indefensible. And I would like to share the story of just one eyewitness account. And this is Olada Aquino. And Olada was a slave. He was captured early in his life. And i read just a, a little bit of his account or just go over his little bit of account about, about his, his uh, journey through, through slavery. He was eventually escaped slavery and learned to read and write. And that's the reason he was able to write his account. But he was kidnapped along with his sister in the central part of Africa. When they kidnapped him as, as a child, him and his sister, they tied them, they gagged them, they had to get them to the ships were on, which were on the coastline, so they marched them to the ships. When they got to the ships, him and his sister were separated. As far as I know, he never saw his sister again. They put him in the ship, they, uh, they put him in shackles, they put as many people as they could inside the ship, laying on planks. They were cold, they were hungry, they were, they were fatigued. He saw all kind of atrocities during that time, including the women slaves being raped and some of the slaves being killed. And then, of course, when he got to the United States, it wasn't really a whole lot better. He was put on a selling block, naked, cold, and sold like a piece of cattle. And that's how slavery occurred in the United States. Now, that doesn't sound like something that God would ever condone, does it to you? It doesn't to me. Alexander Falconbridge was a surgeon on, on the board of some of the slave ships at that time. Uh, and the slave ships were primarily owned by the British. The British, their part in slavery wasn't that they hired slaves in Great Britain. No, they, they hired the ships that took the slaves to America and to the Americas and to the Caribbeans. And Al Alexander Falconbridge was on some of those ships. He was a surgeon. He was a doctor. And he saw th what was going on during that time and he saw the decks and these, these, these slaves that were put on these decks that, uh, and these planks where the skin would actually rub off their skin, they would bleed. One out of 10 slaves did not make it to the United States. One out of 10 died on, on route here, what they called the Middle Passage. And he saw this and it was just the, the blood that was on the decks of those ships was horrible. The, 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 the smell that was on these ships was horrible. Some cases they lost a whole lot more than one out of 10. They lost in some cases two thirds of their, of their cargo because they didn't want to lose that cargo. That was worth money to them, but still it happened. So Falconbridge in looking at this and writing about it said, it is not in the power of human imagination to picture a situation to itself more dreadful or disgusting talking about these slave ships. In the United States, there was little or no regulation. Slaves were sold like cattle, usually stripped naked on, on the selling blocks. Families were frequently, if not mostly, separated, never to be seen again. Slaves were treated like a subspecies. Now, we talked about slave, slaveries in the Old Testament, New Testament. The in interesting thing about the slavery in the Old Testament, New Testament, is that it wasn't racial, wasn't racially motivated. It wasn't racially motivated at all, but in slavery in America, it was. The African American, the black man and woman, was treated as something sub subhuman. Unfortunately, that attitude continued into the United States well after sl slavery was abolished, didn't it? We saw it in the Jim Crow laws of the South, of the South where an African American could not even drink at the same water fountain as a Caucasian could. That's the old vestitudes of slavery that were brought over even to modern times. But there was no regulation. A, a, a slave owner during, uh, during this time could basically do what he or she wanted to with their slaves and, and, and get by with it for the most part. Very little laws in the United States. So I think clearly, clearly there's a difference between what we read about in the Old Testament, what we read about in the New Testament, and how we see slavery was, slavery was practiced in, uh, in, in the United States and in the Americas. Let, I, if you don't believe that, I want to show you a few passages. Le, look at uh, Exodus 21. This is one of the regulations regarding slavery in the, the Old Testament. Concerning a slave, verse 20, let's start with. 
If a man strikes his male or female slave with a rod and he dies at his hand, he shall be punished. If, however, he survives a day or two, no vengeance shall be taken, for he is his property. But, verse 22, if a man struggle with each other and strike a woman with child so that she is miscarried, yet there is no further injury, he, he shall surely be fined as the woman's husband may be demand him, and she shall pay the judge's um, uh, she shall, he shall pay as the judges decide. But if there are any further injury, then you shall appoint as a penalty life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, and bruise for a bruise. And then tw 26 is one I really wanted to look at as well as 27. And if a man strikes the eye of his male or female slave and destroys it, he shall let him go free on account of his eye. You were to free a slave if you injured that slave. If you knocked his eye out, he was to go free. That didn't happen here. If he knocks out a tooth of his male or female slave, he shall let him go free on account of his tooth. You could let the slave go free, and had to let the slave go free if you knocked his tooth out. And we read that again. That's, that's Exodus, Exodus 21, verse 27. How about a runaway slave? In Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 15 and 16. You shall not hand over to his master a slave who has escaped his master to you. He shall live with you in your midst and in the place which you shall choose in one of your towns where it pleases him. You shall not mistreat him. If a slave ran away in, in America, that he was to be sent back to his slave owner, if not killed, not, and certainly would have been tortured or beat. In the Old Testament, that wasn't the case, was it? They could stay with the person that they went to. How about in the New Testament? Turn to Timothy. Let's turn to 1 Timothy. I'm going to pick up with verse 10. This is part of a, of, a, of a longer dissertation here by Paul. But verse 10 says, An immoral man and homosexuals and kidnappers and liars and perjurers and whatever else is contrary to this teaching according to the glorious gospel that is preached which I have entrusted. Uh, this was a violation of the law. Paul condemned kidnapping as well as he condemned lawlessness, unrighteousness, and other sin. To kidnap someone, to say take some, to take someone against their will, was clearly a violation of God's law, and that's exactly what we saw here, or what we saw in our in our country years and years ago. Now I haven't read all the passages. I had on, I don't have time to do that. But we read those passages as they dealt with slavery uh, in Jerry's sermon. But again, we know that servants were part of the New Testament and that they were converted and they were to be treated they weren't to be treated harshly yet they were to be submissive to the people that were over them we understand that but I think you have to ignore a lot of plain teaching to say <coughs> excuse me that slavery as we know it is not condoned by God if nothing else look at Matthew chapter 7 these were verses when I was you know growing up in the church that I would read and I'd say how in the world can slavery in the United States, it was practiced here, be, be a good thing? When I know what Matthew 7, verse 12 says, Therefore, however you want people to treat you, so treat them, for this is the law and the prophets. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be kidnapped. And I don't want to be sent across the sea in chains and be working for someone against my will. I wouldn't do that voluntarily. You'd have to be kidnapped to do that. And... I wouldn't want to treat someone that way either, would you? Verse 12, one more time. Therefore, however you want people to treat you, so treat them, for this is the law and the prophets. 1 Corinthians. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I think I went one too, too soon. Let's look at Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each one of you regard one another as more important 
to him uh, than himself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. Have this attitude in you, excuse me, have this attitude in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus. Does anything about that verse sound like it is something that God would have allowed to have occurred during the, uh, the sla slavery of the uh, 17th and 18th centuries here in America? Of course not. How about Galatians chapter 5, verse 22? These are the fruits of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. Does any of that sound like what happened? I don't, I don't want to belabor this point, but that's just now how we got slaves in the United States. None of that would have been the fruit of the Spirit. None of those things. Joy, love, peace, patience, kindness. Kindness? No. It wasn't kindness to... to uh, kidnap someone and take them from their home. Couldn't have been anything further from that. In fact, I think basically the whole New Testament is an indictment of the kind of slavery that we saw in the United States. And to say that God didn't condone it, but he didn't condemn it to me is ignoring some very important scriptures that we can read in our New Testament. How did it occur? When did change occur? How did it occur? We know that, again, it started in the early 1600s. Had its roots actually in the United States. The Quakers in, in 1745 saw that was going on. They saw the atrocities that were going on and um, uh, they started to try to make a change. And actually this went back to Great Britain to, to stop the, tra the slave trade. He had to stop the slave trade first to, to stop slavery because there was a big desire and there was a big need for slaves. If you transport 11 million people during that time, there was, was kind of like drugs are today. There's a big reason those people were transported. People wanted to buy them. The seeds of change, I think, may have been in the New Testament. We already read these verses, but 1, Corinthians, uh, 1 Timothy 1.10 talks about those men stealers. That, that could have something to do with it. And we know that Paul told the, uh, the slaves or the servants in 1 Corinthians 7.21 in King James Version, uh, certainly used the word servant, but if thou mayest be free, use it rather. And then again, Galatians uh, 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 3 and verse uh, 28. When it got to Great Britain, there was a fellow by the name of William Wilberforce. He was an MP. That stands uh, for Member of Parliament. He was of uh, the House of Commons, I believe. He was a Christian, and he didn't know too much about slavery, but he was introduced to the atrocities of slavery, and he began a long time, almost lifelong work of trying to abolish the slave trade. He worked with uh, William Pitt, who was the prime minister at the time, and even with the prime minister's help, it took a while. He also had the help of John Newton, who was an evangelist during that time. Uh, we would call him Episcopal evangelist at, th at this point, uh, probably Angl Anglican back then. But he worked to get the slave trade abolished. It took him, as you can see there, from 1786 to 1806 to finally get that law changed. Why did it take so long? Well, people like the sugar, <laughs> for one thing. And the, the British considered it a necessary evil. But nonetheless, after 20 years of work, John, uh, William Wilberforce was able to get it passed and the, the slave trade was abolished in 1806. Now, obviously, slavery continued on for some time. They just weren't getting new slaves now. They, the slaves were those that were uh, basically bred in the United States. But he did, get it, he did get it changed. It took him a long time. It took America another 60 years, though, almost 60 years before the Emancipation Proclamation, where slavery was finally abolished, uh, thankfully, at the cost of 600,000 lives. That's more lives, I don't know if that's still true or not, but when I was in high school, I was told that was more lives than any other of the wars that America has been involved in, in total. Add up the number of lives that were lost in World War I, World War II, the Revolutionary War, the Vietnam War, so on and so forth, and you still won't come up with 600,000 lives, but yet it took 600,000 lives for slavery to finally be abolished in, in America. And like I say, thankfully so, we don't have it here at this type of slavery now. As I mentioned earlier, though, there is slavery. To say there's no slavery today is ignoring uh, what's, what, what the reality is. I will say this before I go to that. The, the, as I said, it had its beginnings with the Quakers and the, and the church and the, and the Gospels. 
looking at passages like I just talked about. And historian from Yale, Harry Stout says, if you pull the church out of the whole equation, it's highly unlikely that uh, that there never would have been a, or excuse me, it is highly likely that there never would have been a civil war. It took people that wanted to see this great abomination that was going on to be stopped. And again, once, I, once again, slavery exists today. Now, you and I don't see it day to day. We don't see people walking around, that we, that we know of at least, that are slaves. But worldwide, it can be very bad. Again, depends on who you look at. Some say 21, some say 40. Pick a number, but 21's a big enough number for me, isn't it you? There's probably 21 million slaves uh, in the world today. Now about a half of them are in debt bondage. Not quite the same as the bond servant of the New Testament, Old Testament, but they're in debt bondage and they can never get out of it. But the rest of them are literal slaves. They've been kidnapped, they've been uh, forced to work. About, uh, and what, what, is the, what is the mover of it? Again, it's greed, it's all about greed. Where do these people, where do these people work? Well, first of all, who are the slaves that we have in the, in the world today? Even, even, even back in the 17th, 18th century, slaves were, again, not people that volunteered to do it, but a lot of times it was people that were uh, ethnic or religious groups, minorities. They were people that a lot of times are just vulnerable to being captured and being taken captive. About 70% of slaves today are female. About 25% of slaves are children working today. And what do they do? They work in factories. They work in the brick kilns of India. They work in the fishing industry. They work in the apparel industry. They work sometimes in the military. When some countries in, in, in the Far East, they're compelled to work uh, uh, and be in the military. They don't want to be. And that's not the same as what I'm saying in the United States. That's not slavery in the United States. That's different, not what we're talking about here. But these people are, are forced against their will to, to, uh, to, to work in the mil military. And once again, they're immigrants, they're children, they're refugees. And again, it's greed that serves, that, that drives all this. But it's estimated that there may be as many as 400,000 slaves in the United States. Now, what kind of slaves do we have in the United States? This is mostly the sex trade. That's what they are. These women are captured. A lot of times they're, they're, they're immigrants or they're, they're uh, refugees. They're taken in and made to, to, to become basically prostitutes against their will. And it's a big deal. It really is a big deal. 400,000 is a big number, and yet they're slaves. So when we say that the institute of slavery, <clears throat> God has never condemned it, I would beg to, give, to differ. He has condemned at least this form of it. And again, these are marginalized groups. You know, there's always been slaves. You go back to the Old Testament, you go back to the history of, of, of humankind from the very beginning, and you'll read records of the Egyptians and Romans and Greeks and so forth. There's always been slaves, but it's an abomination. It's not something that, that we want to ever be part of or, or agree that it was okay to do. There's nothing remotely Christian about slavery as we define it today. It ignores the dignity of the individual. It takes away all basic human rights. It is driven by greed with reckless abandon for right and wrong and the word of God. The great emancipator of Abraham Lincoln, I love this quote. And he's talking about, again, the slavery as it existed during his time in the 1800s. He said, if slavery is not wrong, nothing is wrong. I want to go back to John Newton. I mentioned earlier that John Newton was involved with William Wilberforce in uh, getting the slave trade abolished and took years and years of his life. John Newton was quite a bit older. If you look at this, if you look at this date, 1807, he barely saw that that slavery abolished, because it was abolished in 1806. But he did live to see it abolished. John Newton, you may not know John Newton right, right offhand, but um, you will after I, uh, I, I talk about him in just a second, but he had firsthand knowledge of slavery because he was a slave trader. He said he indulged himself to follow a course of evil. And so he saw slavery, he saw slave trading up close and personal. And he was a slave trader, he became the captain of slave trading ships. During one particular difficult voyage across the Atlantic, he saw 62 out of 218 slaves die. Then in 1748, he had what I would call an epiphany. He was on a ship called the Greyhound, coming across the Atlantic with slaves, and this ship was going down. Now they were all gonna die. And it was, it was, look, it looked 
bad for everyone involved, including the captains, including the, the, the first, first hand mates. And at that time, he had this epiphany and he, changed, and he changed his life. It didn't change it immediately. Some people look, read about John Newton, they think as soon as this happened, he went back to England and became a Christian and never did any slave trading again. That's not really what happened. He kept it up for a little bit longer, but he finally came to the conclusion that it was just morally wrong. It was wrong after reading God's word. And this epiphany that he had in 1748, 1748 changed his life forever, and he became uh, a preacher, as we talked about, preached many sermons in, in England, again, uh, Episcopal uh, uh, sermons. But if you take your songbook out, I'd like you to turn to page 205. Look at the bottom. John Newton wrote this song in 1779, basically just before uh, New Year's Eve of 1779. And I don't want to read the whole song, but I do want to read verses 1 and 2 because I, can, I think you can see where he's coming from. By the way, Amazing Grace is the most popular hymn of all time. There's nothing that comes close to it. Uh, in the United States alone, there's over 3,000 recordings of this song that have been recorded over the years. There's no hymn that we sing or that has been song, sung that can come close to the popularity of Amazing Grace. But look at verse 1 and 3 with me and see if there's anything there that maybe you can see what, had, what motivated um, John Newton to write this song. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now was, I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. I think he's alluding to his days when he was a slave trader. That's what I think. It makes the most sense. Verse 3. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. And I think there he's alluding to that shipwreck, almost shipwreck that they barely survived on the Greyhound. It was grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. When he wrote Amazing Grace, they wrote a lot of songs. And there's other songs in our hymnal that have John Newton in it, but he wrote hundreds and hundreds of songs. It was not a real popular song or a real popular piece of poetry in Great Britain at the time. But it was eventually brought to America. And it, during uh, 1835, a fellow by the name of William Walker finally published it in an American hymn book. And he put it to a tune. John Newton didn't write his own music. He wrote the lyrics. He was, he was a lyricist, not necessarily uh, the, the music part. But he put it to a tune. Of course, it's a tune that we know very well and we're very familiar with. And it became to be a, a very popular tune and became very popular in the, became, became more popular in America a lot more than it did in Great Britain. But Walker added the fifth verse of this song. And this fifth verse has always been my favorite verse of the song. Um, um, I know a lot of people that think this fifth verse that's in this song, most, maybe, the, maybe the most important verse in the song, certainly it's one of my favorite verses. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. That wasn't written by John Newton. That was added. William Walker found this verse in Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin. That's where this verse came from. Where did Harriet Beecher Stowe get this verse? From American slaves. And I think that's very ironic. This, this verse that's part of this great story of, of John Newton, the last verse that we sing, and we think, again, I think it's one of the best verses in the, in, of, of the song, came from slaves in the United States. So, let's go back to the question. What kind of slave owner was Philemon? Do you think Philemon was a slave owner who had kidnapped Onesimus? and made him work against his will and treated him harshly and would not let him go like we see in the, in the, in the United States of the 17th, 18th century? I think not. Had he been that type of slave owner, Paul would have commanded him to release Onesimus. Because, just because, well, he's a slave now. No, that, that, just, just because he's a slave now. If he had, been, if he had, been, uh, had, had gone into servitude against his will like that, I think Paul would have commanded Philemon to release him, but he didn't. 
So I'm left to believe that he probably was a bond servant. And in fact, I think the verses in the New Testament that deal with slavery are dealing with people who are bond servants. And uh, you may disagree with me on that, but I just think any other way doesn't make sense to me. That they're there against their will. If they have been kidnapped, First Timothy says kidnapping was a sin. It was lawlessness. It was not to be, condem- uh, not to be condoned at all. Well, there's a way in which we're all servants. In fact, everyone, in, in, whether they be a Christian or not, is a servant. A slave, servant, whatever you will. You're either going to be a servant to sin, or you're going to be a servant to God, aren't you? Paul called himself a servant, slave. Roman one, Romans 1, 1, Titus 1, 1. James called himself a slave or bond servant in James 1, 1. They were not forced to become Christians. They were not Christians against their will. They were bond servants to Christ. Just as those that sin can get out of that. They're not forced to sin. We're not forced to be a servant to sin. But we will be a servant to someone. We're either a servant to God or we're a servant to, to uh, humanity or a servant to sin. Luke 17.10, the great parable says, So you too, when you do all the things you have comm- that which are commanded you, say we are unworthy slaves. We have done only that which we ought to have done. So uh, this sermon has not been about the plan of salvation but there may be someone in the audience that uh, has been thinking about becoming a Christian we certainly like to always give the invitation the water's here we've got the apparel ready and that's ready at any time you can become a Christian at any time of the day it doesn't have to be after a sermon but this is a convenient time to do it if you've been sitting on the bench sort of thinking about it this is a good time to do it there's no time like like now or if there's any other reason you need to uh, come to the front we ask you to do that as we stand and